days with you, and we're praying and trusting that by God's grace and His help, that something has been said to contribute, make a difference in your life, in your home, in your marriage, in your relationships, and there's something that you can give to someone else, hopefully by the grace of God and help of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you so very much, and to Brother and Sister Ron Dobbs and their friendship and love through the years, and I'm so glad to see that he's doing much better, and that God's given his mechanical hip to him, and that, and that he's getting along well, and Sister Judy, we love them. Wasn't it good to hear him sing tonight? We, we just really enjoy music out of the heart that just glorifies and honors Christ. There's nothing, there's not a musical instrument made by the hands of man that can even begin to touch a human voice that has the ability to sing. And so thank you, brother and sister Ron. I, I sure do love you and appreciate you so very, very much. Look forward to your next book coming out. And he sent me a copy of the first one. And I want to tell you something. I read it very quickly. I am a reader. And uh, I read it very, very quickly. And I appreciate it. It was convicting, enlightening, and encouraging, and hopeful. Thank you so very much. And um, that's the worth of the book. No, it's not either. <laughs> I better be careful. I'm behind the pulpit. God will kill me. <laughs> I, it was my privilege to be asked to do so. Thank you so much, preacher. And Brother David, thank you. And I'm glad that you're in this place doing what God's called you to do. Rachel and all the children, I've enjoyed them so very, very much. Today, my wife and I, uh, we just kind of, you know, Motel rooms are not conducive. Uh, I've been in them all the time, and you really get tired of them. I mean, you're just in so many square feet and just do so much, and finally get tired of not doing even that. So she and I, we enjoy spending some time in antique stores and things of that nature. Not necessarily that we like antiques, although some are pretty, but I guess probably because we have become antiques. And... Um, <laughs> But we found an antique shop just about three miles north of our motel. It is one of the nicest antique stores I've been in anywhere, and that's, that is a fact. And it was just wonderfully well done, laid out, clean, orderly. We just really enjoyed it and found something that she wanted to get for the grandkids, and we purchased that. But we saw a sign, and I took a picture of it. Because the reason I took a picture of it, I can't remember it most of the time. But anyway, it says, at my age, flowers scare me. <laughs> I thought that was great. Really good. Yeah. Take your Bible with me, if you would, please, tonight. And what chapter are we going to turn to in what book? Anybody remember? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5. So turn there, if you would. And... Um, I want to just rehearse without going into great detail what we talked about last night. We talked about four major causes of divorce. It was money, religion, in-laws, sexual attitudes. And then we touched on problem solving in our relationship. And the very heart of problem solving is communication. And so I hope that many of you got those notes and that it has helped you or will help you. And so tonight we want to give our attention to this time into Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to begin with verse 18, but before we do, uh, I want to tell a little story, and it's a true story. It's about myself, and some of you will remember this time. Back in 1978, in the month of February, a blizzard came through Indiana Michigan, Ohio, and the western side of Pennsylvania. It was an awesome time. For the state of Ohio and its history, it was the worst blizzard to ever come into the state of Ohio. How many remember that? Anybody remember that? It was, it was really quite a time. We literally got snowbound into our home. A 
At that time, our house kind of set up above the sidewalk and the street. We lived in town in those days. And um, it snowed so quickly and so much at that time that it literally covered the cars up on our street. All you could see is an occasional antenna sticking up out of the snow. A lot of things occurred during those days, uh, snow drifts and things of that nature. But I was raised on a farm, so I am not a person to sit in the house and just do nothing. And uh, I was going to stir crazy, and especially with four children at that time. Not that they bothered me, but they bothered me. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I came up with this thought, this idea, and I went to my sweetheart and I said, Honey, you know what I'm going to do? She said, What? I said, I'm going to make a cake. She looked at me kind of troubled. She said, you've never made a cake in your life. I said, well, there's always a first time. And she said, well, let's make it together. I said, no, I don't want you to help me. I, I want this to be my cake. And she said, well, all right. I said, there's cake mixes and stuff. And I said, I don't want to make cake, a cake mix. I said, my mother's never made a cake out of a cake mix. There's always some scratch. And her son's going to make a cake out of scratch. And she just kind of raised her eyebrows and said, well, uh-huh. And she went about her business, and so I went in the kitchen, and I got things together and figured this out and figured that out, and I preheated the oven, and I poured and I mixed and I stirred. And finally I got the stuff poured into these cake pans, and I put it in the oven. I had an oven in those days, which probably most of us even do today, that had a window in it. And you could watch what was going on. And it was amazing. While I was cleaning up some of my stuff, I went over to check my cake, and it was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. It looked like two derby hats had, <laughs> had been put in that oven. It was, it was incredible. And um, I called her. I said, come here, babe. Uh, look at my cakes. And she came in. She bit down. She looked in. She saw the same thing I did. But all of her response was, yeah. She turned around and walked off. Never said to me anymore. That, yeah. I mean, you know, to a novice cook, that's not very encouraging. So she went about her business, and pretty soon time came, and the bell rang. And um, I went to get my cake out, but before I did, I, I got a toothpick. I saw my mother do this, never did understand why she did it, but she always would take a cake out of the oven. She'd always had that toothpick or a, or a broom straw, and she would stick in the cake. I never did understand. I do now. But so I got me a toothpick, and I opened the door, and I started to go like this, and a miracle came happen. My cake disappeared. There wasn't enough cake in there to make one brownie. Here she comes, Mrs. Knows. She came, she said, let me see your cake. I said, just get out of here. <laughs> go, go, go do something else. She said, no, I want to see your cake. So she insisted, and all she said was, well, honey, you must have left something out of the recipe. And I said, no, 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 I no, I didn't. She said, well, let's check it out. So she went through my ingredients, sure enough. I left one thing out of that ingredient that wouldn't work. What I want to give you tonight is a recipe. It's a recipe on biblical ingredients for a godly marriage. There's three kinds of ingredients in our recipe tonight. There are ingredients for the husband. There are ingredients for the wife. And then there are ingredients that are collective. They're for both. You cannot one out. I've had people come into my counseling office and I'd say, well, how's it going? And I've had them say something very similar to this, if not exactly like this. Well, preacher, I appreciate you what you're trying to do, but the information you're giving me is not working. I'd say, all right, I'll tell you what to do, much like my wife did in those early days. Let me see your recipe. My dear friend, this recipe is not multiple choice. 
It's not take what I want and leave what I don't want. If this recipe is going to work, you have to have every ingredient in place in order order for it to work. I can take you, and I gave you a couple little examples last night, but I can take you to literally hundreds of people that sat before my desk through many, many years of this advice that could stand here tonight and say it works. Through this, God changed our home, changed our marriage. Why does it work? Because it's infallible, because God's Word is infallible. Not only is God's Word something we can take through our life to make a difference, but we can walk into eternity making a difference. So here's what I want to do tonight, and, and I appreciate you being so patient. I know I've preached long. And I want to warn you tonight, it's probably not going to be any difference. As a matter of fact, I know it's not. But I want you to listen very, very carefully. I'm going to try to give you as much as I can in appropriate time. And I had several people ask me at different pieces of questions and advice last night, which I appreciate. And if I can help you, I, I do want to help you. But start with me in Ephesians 5. We will read our scripture, then we'll make our prayer. Let's begin reading with verse 18 of Ephesians 5. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speak yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Salt men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's bow for prayer. Jesus. I really believe that you've been with us in a very real way in these past meetings. And Father, we ask that we would be well hid in Christ tonight. And that, dear Jesus, you would allow the Word of God to be magnified to our mind, our heart, and our understanding. And if we know anything, we know and understand, and maybe in some personal ways here, that Satan is the enemy of the home. He's the enemy of a relationship of marriage. And Father, we want him defeated. We want him beat out of our life, out of our homes, out of our relationships. And so, dear God, for your sake, for the sake of husbands and wives and families and homes, I ask that I be well hid in you. And dear God, I would be well in the control of your hand. May it not be me, and Father, somehow may I die to self tonight, that you would use me as an instrument in the hands of the Holy Spirit in a very real way. Please, dear God, work. Dear God, I pray. All of it with thanksgiving. I want to give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Last evening, I made this statement. In order for a marriage to work, you must work at the marriage. That is forever true. You never say, well, when is the work over? Never. 
I must give a daily investment of the fullness of all that I am to the relationship that God has given me with my sweetheart. Anytime I lay that down and forget it as an equation in my life, Satan will take his possession and his position in our relationship and he'll shake it up somehow. Some of you know that very well because of difficulties that you have had or perhaps you are having. I want us to look, if you would, please, and here's how I'm going to do it. We're going to go verse by verse. And in this verse by verse, we are giving the recipe, and we're going to say this. In this verse, we have this many ingredients, and it's for the husband, wife, or his collective. That way, in your notes, you'll be able to keep order of what it is. So let's look, and we're going to read the verses again. And then I will make my remarks with the help of the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, notice what it says. And be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There are three ingredients in this verse, and all three are collective. I want you to notice very carefully what he says. And be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with with the Spirit. It has been my responsibility many a time in my pastorate of 44 years and one day to have to deal with an individual that is drunk. It's not fun, it's not pleasurable, and it's not one of the things that I cherish to have had to do, but I have had to do it, as I'm sure this pastor has had to do it, and perhaps you have as well, David. You cannot reason with a drunk. You cannot sit down and speak words of wisdom to them. The reason being is they are not serious. As a matter of fact, some of them are so inebriated that they don't even remember you're talking to them. Or they're drunken, or they're anti in the process of their drunken stupor. The first thing about marriage is this. The first ingredient in our relationship, it's serious. We do not enter into it lightly or unadvisedly. That's part of giving of the vows. Why is it? Because it is serious enough that we say, until death alone shall part the two of us. Now that either is just a statement to get to an end or it is a matter of the heart of seriousness that I mean this. I was young when I got married. My sweetheart was 18. I was 19. But I knew what I was doing. It wasn't just a rush into something that I thought that would lead to a marriage bed. It was a lifelong commitment that I was going to be with this person for the rest of my life. Whatever the rest of my life would be, it was going to be that with this individual. No exits, no reverses, no way out. It was until death part the two of us. She felt that same way as a young girl. I felt that same way as what I thought to be a young man. After I said I do, it finally dawned on me shortly thereafter just how much of a man I was or wasn't. But it was serious. It was a serious matter. Here's where society is today. Well, if it doesn't work, I'll just get out of it. Now, I know you're going to think this strange, and that's all right. But one of the articles that I read every day when I'm home and I have access to the paper is Dear Abby. Now, I don't read her for wisdom. 
I read her for stupidity. <laughs> because in general, she is not wise in her statements and in her counsel. Because what she does when she addresses marital issues, many times she'll say, you need to get to a marriage counselor. You need to find a psychologist or you need to sit before a psychiatrist. Or sometimes she doesn't even do that. Oftentimes, and most generally, she will say after hearing the problem, you need to get a divorce. Or she condones the divorce. I don't condone divorce because the Bible doesn't. Now, are there reasons for divorce? Yes, I believe there are. And I believe that 1 Corinthians 7 addresses that issue. But just to get a divorce, to get a divorce, to get away from problems and troubles, you're not solving anything. If you do not solve the problems of this, you will not be rid of problems. Whatever caused the demise in this relationship, unresolved, will continue in any relationship. But here's what I found. If you're willing to resolve and correct the problem here, there is a good chance that you will maintain a good and a healthy and a loving relationship with what you have. You said, but preacher, you don't know my relationship. No, I don't. But I know God. Amen. I know His Word. And I know it's infallible. And I know when I yield to it, it does its job in my life Amen. and in my heart. Nothing man-made is beyond the God that made everything. Amen. Don't lose that reality. So marriage is serious. We must take it. That this is serious. And I'll tell young people before I ever perform their ceremony, if this isn't serious to you, stop right here. Don't pursue it any further than that. It is till death alone. Then not only is it serious, but this is the second most spiritual thing that you ever commit yourself to in life. First is a relationship to Jesus Christ. To be born again of God, that's the greatest decision man, woman will ever make in their life is to come to know Christ. <coughs> the second is to have a marriage that is spiritual in its concept, built upon biblical principles. It is a covenant between me, my spouse, and Almighty God. He has set the rules, I have accepted them, and they are going to be the authority of our relationship. Please, someone say amen right there. Now, not only is marriage serious, not only is it spiritual, but look at the third ingredient in this. It's found in the latter phrase of verse 18. But be filled with the Spirit. The third ingredient to our relationship in marriage is we are to be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. The control of the Holy Spirit of God comes by the filling, F-I-L-L-I-N-G, of the Holy Spirit that produces healthy feelings, F-E-E-L-I-N-G-S. Got it? Under the control of. See, if I have the control of the Holy Spirit in my life and I allow Him to control me in my relationship with my wife, she has the same commitment in her life because this is a collective ingredient. And if we have the same direction, can two walk together lest they be agreed? So as we walk together in agreement under the condition of the Holy Spirit in our life, we cannot be misled. We are walking in harmony of one another. So in verse 18, we are under the spirit control. 
we're having a spiritual relationship and we've taken it as serious as it is. Verse 19. Let's look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Three ingredients, and they are all collective. First of all, we have the ingredients of happiness. You say, where that's found? Well, um, unless you're listening to country western music, where they're having problems because somebody got drunk and did something stupid, uh, and uh, don't get me wrong, I like certain aspects of country western music because that's where I come from, all right? And, uh, but uh, if you want to get really down into, if, you, if you're depressed, just listen to more country western music and it'll depress you more. And it'll make you want to go out and get drunk. And, uh, but here's what we have. No one, no one in this room, no one in this room that is married or anticipates to be married gets married because they want to be miserable. I want to be miserable life, so I think I'm just going to get married. I never thought that. You never thought that. You got married because you believed that this relationship would give you happiness. And how many times I've had people sitting in front of my counseling desk that's never had a day of happiness. Much regret. But let's follow the music theme. Not only is this to make me happy, the music tonight that I've heard made me happy. The music that our brother has led us through Sunday through tonight makes me happy. It's good music. It gets into the heart. Happy. But also it's to cause our relationship to be melodious. A melodious, that's even. A constant, harmonious meet, beat. You know, a melody is that which speaks to the heart of a song. Not only am I to be happy, but I am to be, it's supposed to be melodious, and then thirdly, it's to be harmonious. When there's no harmony, and they were found in one place in one accord. That's the book of Acts to the empowered church in Jerusalem. Have you ever heard anyone say, our home, our marriage is a war zone. We are battling most of the time. Why would you live that way when you don't have to live that way? Collectively, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, where is the direction of that happiness and melody and harmony Where is the direction to be directed of this in our relationship to the Lord? I know that's going to sound a little bit strange perhaps, but we are to get married for Him. There used to be an old song, and this will date me, but I can't deny it, my hair betrays me. (laughs) But it used to be an old song that was sang at Weddings, each for the other, both for the Lord. Was a good song then, it's a good song now. Why are we getting married? We're getting married that our relationship to God would bring attention to what man can have when it is lived to the glory of God. I've had many a people say, and young people say this, and maybe even young adults say this to me, I'll never get married. I've seen what it does to people. I've seen what it does to my mother and father. I lived in horrible conditions. I'm never going to get married. My dear friend, I hoped and prayed that my wife and I would live in such a manner that our children would thirst for what we had. 
that we would be the example. Where did I learn to be the husband, hopefully, that I've tried my best to be to this woman over here? I did not learn it from a book. I learned it from my father. He was a teacher, whether he knew he was or not, but I believe with all my heart that he knew much of what he was doing in our presence to teach us what we needed to know in the role of being a husband and a father. Happy, melodious, harmonious, as unto the Lord. Now look at verse 20. And I'm not developing these things fully because of time, but look at verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we have... Here we have one ingredient. It is collective. You say, we're ever going to get to the individual. Oh, it's coming. But look what it is in verse 20. One ingredient, collective, and it's the ingredient of thankfulness, thanksgiving, and to be thankful unto God. Not to get married and say, what in the world did I do? Why did I do this? But as the days get into weeks, the weeks get into months, you can look at this individual that you have married and say, thank God you brought her into my life. Thank God she is my gift from God. Thank God for my wife. The gift of thanksgiving. Now, the gift of thanksgiving is to be told, it is to be showed. You'll hear that repeated then on the subject of love in just a moment. I am to tell my wife how thankful I am, and I do. I thank her for keeping the house the way she does. My house is immaculate because of her energy and her love and her desire. Many a time when I was pastoring, going into the no-care situations, I've come home and just wrapped my arms around her and thanked her for the person she was and the home that she's given me and the meals that she's fixed me and the sacrifices that she's made for my comfort. Sometimes she would know that I was in certain counseling situations and I never brought them home, and you can ask that. I never lost the integrity of counsel or the lack of trust in my counsel. I never shared it with anyone. My home was my oasis, and I didn't need to bring in problems and troubles from the church or from people into my home to cause discomfort. But sometimes I'd come home, and I'd just find her, and I'd put my arms around her, and I'd give her a big old kiss, and I'd tell her how thankful I was and tell her how much I loved her. And here's what her response was. You've had a tough one. <laughs> You've had a tough one. To be thankful. When's the last time that you, for whatever reason, got your spouse off to the side and said, thank you? Thank you. Now, listen to me. You say, but preacher... My husband, and you can tell the story, or my wife, surely there's one thing, one thing that you can say thank you for. Dwell on that. Dwell on that. Be that mark that you can at least, maybe surprisingly, tell your spouse that you are thankful for whatever it is. Thank you for your investment of time. Thank you for the investment that you've given. To this week I have been listening or been thinking of something and it's totally independent of this, but my wife and I will be speaking in a large marriage conference in February down in Gatlinburg and we've been in that conference, Faith for the Family, about this. I think this will be our fourth time there and it's large, and, and many people attend it. And uh, I'll be speaking there. She'll be speaking there again in February. And I've been thinking about gifts that you can give to your relationship. 
And, and I've just been thinking about it. The gift of self, the gift of listening, the gift of time, the gift of right, proper response, the gift of smiles, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of understanding, the gift of quietness. Sometimes no words are better than words. Those are just a few that I've written down, but thanksgiving, the ingredient of being thankful. Now let's look at verse 21. And verse 21, I'm so thankful, comes before verse 22. A lot of men have memorized half of verse 22. My wife is submissive, and if she's not, I'll break her neck. I've heard people say basically that. I've had them tell me that. My wife, I'm the boss in my family. I'm the dictator in my home. Well, shame on you. Because before you ever get to verse 22, men, you've got to deal with verse 21. Look what it says, and there's a key word in this verse. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We understand the word submit, or we should. But the key word in verse 21 is not just the word of submission, but notice what it says, that we each are to be submissive to one another. I have a role and a responsibility to be submissive to this individual as her husband. There is to be a discipline in my life that is personified in my care for her. Well, I don't tell my wife anything. Maybe that's kind of maybe your problem. If I want to go somewhere, I go somewhere. I don't ask her. I don't tell her. Well, have you ever thought that maybe, maybe there are plans that you need to understand, that you need to be there? My wife better tell me where she's at who she's with, where she's going, what time she'll be back home. Why is that good for the goose and not good for the gander? Where do you get that from? My wife has the right to know when I'm going, where I'm going, and when I intend to come back. And sometimes that's not easy to tell her. Because where I'm going has to do with her and a surprise. And I've got an admission to make. I lie to her. Every once in a while, then I have to not only ask God to forgive me, I have to ask my wife to forgive me. Because then ultimately when she finds out why I went where I went was because of her, she understands because the moment I tried to skirt the issue with her, she figures it out. It's no fun. <laughs> dual, here it is, dual submission. That's the ingredient. Respect for each other. But notice how it concludes in verse 21, in the fear of God. In the fear of God. My father was a wonderful man. He's been with Jesus for a long, long time. I miss him. He was a little structured guy, but he was a man, all man. And I could tell you some stories that would convince you that I'm right in the summation that he was all man. But I'll not take that time. But I loved him with an intense love that I cannot even begin to define for you. To this day, I feel that way about my dad. But as surely as I loved him, I was balanced in this emotion that I feared him. <coughs> he gave me reason. His word was solid. Although he was good at math, he never counted when it came to bliss, discipline. Have you ever heard a parent say, I'm going to count to three? My dad didn't know how to count. My dad just reacted. He would instruct first, and then if we did not obey the instruction, God helped everybody. 
I've had people say, I bet you got half beat to death in your life. No, the one beating I got was sufficient. It never left my mind and it caused cold chills to run up my spine today. My father kept his word. And one of the most hollow sounds that I've ever can remember between my brother next to me, there's eight of us children, five sisters, and I had two brothers older than me and I was the youngest, but my brother next to me is two and a half years older but there was, two, there was a phrase my daddy would say, if we were on the road and not home, and my father, all he would say is this, boys, when we get home. Can I, can I relive this past moment? When I get home, or when we get home. And then he added this to it, go to the barn. I walked in with trepidation. He had a tobacco lad out there. And my daddy knew how to get your attention. No, my daddy didn't beat me much. I carried a PhD in common sense. It wasn't worth it. (laughs) It just was not worth it. Submission. Dual submission. You know what it does? If I show my wife respect, she respects me for the respect given. Now let's look at verse 22. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. That's not a period. Is it in your Bible? No, that's not, that's not a period. It's called a comma. The thought continues. Notice what he says. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, comma, as unto the Lord. Don't turn there, but if you were to turn to Colossians 3.18, it says, as is fit in the Lord, or in Green's paraphrase, as is right in the Lord. I could tell you more things that you would scratch your head at. I want to say this very, very carefully. I had a man and a woman in my church many, many years ago. He had a physical problem that came into his life, midlife. And as a result of it, and as careful as I can say, it affected the part of his life of intimacy. He, he was one of those CD Christians I talked about last night. And um, his wife one morning came into my study and she said, Pastor said, uh, I've really got to deal something hard with my husband, and if I must, I don't know how I'm going to perform it. But she went into the private part of their life, dealing with his inabilities. And she said, he is telling me, and he's quoting scripture. And I said, what scripture would that be? said, well, it's somewhere in the New Testament, but it so goes something like this, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. And that's all she said. And she told me a story of his expectation to him that was absolutely demonic. And she said, must I? Is that true? I took my Bible, I turned it around, and I said, he needs to learn the last half of that verse. Don't miss what I'm getting ready to tell you. Here you find the word submission. That wives are to be submissive to their husbands. Down in verse 31 it says, and wives, revere, show reverence to your husband." How do you submit to wrong? 
How do you revere what is wrong? You can't. As is fit in the Lord, as unto the Lord. Your submission and your reverence is based upon that which is doing right and honorable to God. God never accepts, expects a lady, a mother, a wife, a spouse in a relationship to submit to that which is not biblically correct. Whatever it is, you're not to obey it. You're not to do it. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So we have one ingredient for the wife and it's wifely submission to her own husband, but as unto the Lord, or as is fit. It is an earned thing. Submission is earned. Reverence is earned. Husbands get it. Then look at verse 23. And I'm going quickly. But look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, and as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait till you hear this one. Wives are sitting there and say, I don't like that submissive thing. I don't like that submissive thing. Wait till you hear this one. Oh, wait till you hear this one. Husbands, look what it says. We have here two ingredients. Two. They are for the husband. And they weigh ten ton apiece. First of all, the husband is to perform, produce godly leadership. Godly leadership. So, fellas, that requires, first of all, you to be saved. Secondly, you to be submissive to the Word of God. Thirdly, you be a student of the Word of God. Submit yourselves. The Bible says, verse 21, I'm sitting in a balcony in a motel room in Florida a number of years ago. And I'll be very honest, honest with you, I'm working on this. I've never taught it before. God moves in my heart, and I'm, I'm putting this thing together. But when I get to verse 21, I have trouble. What is dual submission? And finally, I really believe the Holy Spirit gave me direction on this thing. Here's what it is. As a husband, I'm to study my role as a Christian husband, see what my responsibilities are, submit myself to that, thus I become submissive to being the husband to my wife that God will require me. But you reverse that around. It's also my wife's responsibility. To study the Word of God and see what the Bible says are her responsibilities to me as a biblical wife and be submissive to those things. Thus, we are both submissive to one another. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's what we touched on last night. Now, not only are you husbands to give a godly leadership, so you cannot give godly leadership from the Word of God, apart from the Word of God. Secondly, oh, don't miss this one. You are to be the Savior of your home. Read it. Read it. Look what he says down in this verse. Notice what he says. He says in verse 23, and he is the Savior of the body. Two questions, men. I want to ask you. When I say Savior, who do you think of? Somebody tell me. Jesus Christ. Absolutely. All right. Question number two. What made him our Savior? He gave himself. So, this is not Webster's definition. This is Roger Green's definition. You can put beside this RDG. 
you wonder what the D stands for, that's Dale. That's my middle name. Here it is. See how close I am. Are you ready? Savior. One who gives the total sum of himself for the full benefit of another. How accurate is that? Did Jesus Christ hold any reserves in the sacrifice of himself? No, he did not. Jesus Christ gave the total sum of all that he was for the full benefit of me and for you. I have this young couple sitting before me, premarital counseling. I'm going through these principles. You know, ignorance has a big mouth. Ignorance just doesn't know when to shut up. This young guy spoke up and he said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. If I'm to be the Savior, listen to this. He asked this question. What do I get out of that? I looked at him and I said, and he followed up with another stupid question after I said this, you get the same thing Jesus did. Well, what was that? They were about 18 inches apart. He was on this side of me and she was on the right side of me and she's just sitting there humbly and I said, the same thing Jesus got was a bride. We've been married almost 55 years. First of all, she's still my girlfriend. But I love telling people this. She's my bride. She was not my bride. She is my bride. I have in my billfold. When I travel, especially overseas... People are always curious about my family. And uh, I carry in my billfold, they want to see my wife. I met my wife January the 2nd of 1966. Man, it didn't take me long to know I wanted to keep her. So after a few weeks, that was long enough, I said, would you give me a picture? She kind of hauled around. And and the next time I saw her, I asked her out for another date. I said, did you give me a picture? She said, yes. It was her graduation picture. She graduated in 1966. I graduated in 1965. She gave me, and she wrote some little sweet nothings on the back, and friendship. She didn't say love. She just said Brenda. I still carry that picture. All dog-eared, beat up. Cheat up. Now, I have another picture of her. Because people want to see her today, and that one's getting pretty chewed up itself. But you can see by this, that's, that's that person. Now, I had... I've had several people ask me this. Why do you still carry that? 55 years. Be 56 years, not long before she gave that to me. Why do you still carry that picture? Because in my heart, that's how I see her. She's still that 17-year-old little girl that I met. Oh, 
Abigail age. Hair change. But her heart still was that little girl. Listen, dear people. People are not understanding what it means in the role of marriage. One who gives the total sum of himself for the full benefit of another. Are you, gentlemen, listen to me, are you understanding that you are to be the Savior of your home? If you give the total sum of all that you are for the full benefit of your home, your marriage, your family, you know what you get? Them. Them. Not just their presence, but their life, their heart. We have five sons. And there's not a one would not beat the world to bits if they touch this person right here. They worship her. Oh, they had their own wives. They had their own children. They adore them the same way. But they sure do love mama. I tried my best in an early age to understand when I saw that I am to give myself as the Savior of our relationship. Now look at verse 24, and we're speeding up. Look at verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And I'm going to just quickly make reference back to verse 22. What can be said in verse 22 is understood in verse 24. It's one ingredient, it's for the wife and it's subjection. But it's subjection as Christ gave himself for the church. And as the church is in subjection to Christ, that is the role of us. The weight of this matter, now listen to me, the weight of this matter rests upon the husband's leadership. I have an idea that there's a number of wives perhaps in our audience here and as well as on Facebook that would stand and wave a banner if their husbands only would be the savior of their home. Look at verse 25. There's two ingredients. It's for the husband. Notice what he says in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. He is Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Two ingredients. First of all, you're to love her. I said last night as my dad asked me how I knew that I loved Brenda. I spit and stuttered around like Porky Pig, but he but he but he never did could tell him. But all you have to do is read the first three to four verses of 1 Corinthians 13, and he defines what love is. Is that the love you have for your spouse? That defines love. And then, notice this, the giving of self. I had a couple in my office many, many years ago, and he was having affairs on his wife. Now, they had five children, but he was having affairs on his wife. They were in my study. I was counseling them. We were getting to the provision, and he said, Pastor said, I'm, I'm really troubled said, I, I provide a good house. I provide a good car for her. I keep the cupboards full of food. The children are well-dressed. And she spoke up. And she said, I've never argued that. That's true, and I thanked you for those things. He said, well, what do you want? I don't understand it. What do you want? I give you those provisions. What do you want? And without hesitation, tears streaming down her face, she looked at him and she said, I want what I married. And he said, and what was that? She said, I want you. I want you. Things are stuff, but you is personal. I want you. There's women all over the world that only have one wife. I have only one person that has become me. Yeah. 
days gone by when I used to fly all over the world. I'd be gone sometimes two and three weeks at a time internationally. Oh, as the weeks and days came down to my last flight coming home. I remember coming home one night and I was on a flight full of high school students. They'd been on some kind of a trip in France or something. And they were, they were rambunctious bunch. I kind of understood. All those parents, that was in the days when parents could come to the gate. It was packed. Between all those kids coming off that airplane, between all the parents that showed up and the people to welcome them, it was bedlam. But when I got off that plane, there was one person I wanted to see. Only one. It was that little lady over there. Why? Because she's me. Part of me was missing. Are you getting any of this? The giving of yourself. Gentlemen, when you cease to give of yourself and try to make up it with it in stuff, your marriage is doomed. Verse 26, two ingredients. It's for the husband. Look what he says. There's two things. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, first of all, to sanctify your marriage. That's a doctrinal word. It's a positional word in the fact that sanctify means to set apart for a particular purpose. On our wedding night, which was November the 26th, 1966, you got that right. I, married, I saw her and met her in January the 2nd of 66. I married her in November of 20, this 2666. And I'd have married a lot sooner, but she slowed me down. <laughs> but notice, when we got married, her father did the wedding. He was our pastor. And we in those days, you had your reception and you were expected to open all your gifts. We never got home until midnight. And I remember carrying her across the threshold. She was still in her wedding gown. I was still in my tux. We'd rent a little bungalow from her boss. And we went to the couch and we knelt and gave our marriage, we gave our home, we sanctified our relationship, we asked God that we would honor Him in our home, and He has blessed us abundantly. You say, but this is years too late. Oh, it's never too late to do right. Never too late to do right. You may have lost certain things, but it's never too late to do right. Sanctify your marriage. Set it apart now. You say, my husband, my wife won't have anything to do with it. You can. There's power in one. And then not only the ingredient of sanctification, but the ingredients of cleanliness. Keep my marriage clean by the washing of the water of the word. John 15, 3 bears that out. John 17, 17 bears that. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Biblical principle, the word of God. Then look with me at verse 27. Two ingredients, it's collective. Look what he says, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Two ingredients. First of all, we're to have the ingredients of example, glorious. As men and women and people survey us, our children look into our relationship, it's a glorious thing that they see. They want it, they hunger after it, they desire it. That's not just happening, that's on purpose and with plan. And then holy, without spot. That's not a word much in preaching anymore. Be ye holy, for I am holy. I want the presence of holiness, the ingredients of holiness in the relationship that I have in Christ. Then look at verse 28. 
Verse 28, so ought men to love the wives as their own bodies. He that loveth himself, or loveth his wife, loveth himself. It's the ingredient, it's the ingredient, one ingredient to the husband, and that I call it same love, equal love. As one, keep this in mind, what's the difference between love and lust? Very simple, love always gives, John 3, 16. God so loved that he gave. Lust always takes. It is always selfishly motivated. It is for my sake in disregard to the other. Then look at verse 29. Two ingredients, and these are for the husband as well. Look what he says. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, even as the Lord the church. So here we have two ingredients there for the husband, and it is a responsibility of the husband to have the ingredient, first of all, to nourish. That is, to provide, bring provision, spiritual, socially, sexually, into that relationship. Nourish, build up, strengthen. And then you are to cherish. What does the word cherish mean? Well, it's an intensified form of of love. But it carries with it an abandonment too. I'm abandoned to this love. Anything else isn't anything. How many times I've had people sit in my counseling office and I've heard them say this to me, both men and women, I love her, but I don't like her. Or I love him, but I don't like him. I understand that. I understand that fully because love is the emotion of one. But like is the ingredients that promotes the love. And when the promotion of like is not there, love soon dims and dwindles. Then look with me, if you would, please. At verses 30 and 31. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. One ingredient is collective, and we'll not go into it except that's the oneness of the relationship. The oneness of the relationship. Shoot two becoming one. We're going to skip verse 32, but look at verse 33. He does call in verse 32 the fact that marriage is a mystery, and it is. And mysteries can't really be explained, otherwise they are not a mystery, so I don't go there. But in verse 33, you have two ingredients, one for the husband and one for the wife. Look what it says. He says, nevertheless... Let every one of you in particular, here it is, so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Two ingredients. First of all, the husband is to love. And love as he would love himself. And if you love your wife, you love yourself. That's what the Bible says in verse 28. And the wife is to revere. It goes along with submission. But it is an earned privilege. Husband, if you're a clod and a jerk and a good for nothing and you are more of a dictator than you are a leader, how in the world can your wife submit to that and revere you? She can't. She just can't. It will not work. Ingredients, I've given some of these to you that really require a lot of time. Dig, study, build on it, and I trust that you will find things that I found. It'll change your life. It'll change your marriage. Now, here's a question that I know is going to be asked. But my spouse... really isn't into this. 
what do I do? You do what is right to do. Love him with the help of God. Honor him when he is honorable. Thank him when he should be thanked. But you be faithful to God. God can do a work when you honor his word. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord. Take him to the science lab. Put him into the test tube and see if he doesn't come out to be exactly who he said he is. Father,